just to let you know, this is kind of a unique experience, you're all guinea pigs tonight in a way, because during lockdown, um, I, um, I set about doing a 4K Ultra HD restoration of Darklands, and I had to track down where the negative was, and I discovered that, you know, nobody, all the production companies involved in making the film were now obsolete. Um, all the labs that had processed the film, obsolete. Um, and there was a kind of a weird uh, paper, paper tra uh, trail to try and find actually where the neg was. And I eventually found it at um, Deluxe Lab. They'd been passed from Soho Images to Technicolor, and there was the Deluxe. And Deluxe were on the verge of, of dumping it because nobody was paying the storage fee. Because uh, all the companies that, that owned the film um, were, were, were gone. Um, so I rescued it um, and uh, took it into uh, a digital lab and um, did a deal with the lab, you know, to, to do the restoration over a couple of months. But actually, because I wasn't paying that much and they were doing me a favor, um, it ended up taking two years. In the last month, we finally got it finished. Uh, and of course, I couldn't resist having a little bit of a tinkle with the edit. Uh, films are never finished. They're, Films are never finished, they're just abandoned. You know? So this <laughs> gave me the opportunity to, to finish it. It's a new cut, it's a new grade. Uh, I, I changed the grading a bit too. Um, and uh, you know, it's, um, I haven't seen it yet. This is the first time I've, I've sat and watched it with an audience, so that, that'll be interesting. But you know, after 25 years, you sort of want to wash your hands at the film <laughs> and move on. You know? So what I'm gonna do is a little ceremony here to finally wash my hands of Darklands. <laughs> my sister, who's also in the film, you, you get brownie points if you spot her, I'm going to do a little ceremony to wash my hands with the film. Oh, oh. oh well <laughs> oh, Yay! Well, it's not tomato sauce, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, well, I couldn't wash my hands of it, yeah. So. <laughs> it goes with the red of the cinema. <laughs> This is, it, it's all, this is what the decor's made of. Yeah. <laughs> right. Make sure we get it on the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> hey. if, for those who haven't seen Dark Fan, this will all make much more sense in a second. Um, yeah, this is, I'm so, so glad you're all here. And uh, we, we're just going to have a lovely time. So I'm just going to wave to the projectionist and to the other fellow that's, uh, that's just in, in the side there. And we'll, uh, we'll start the film. So, I mean, that's great fun. And first of all, your sister. Did anybody get anybody anybody in the audience? Petrol station? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, links to chapter. I mean, we work still now today with Phil Babbitt and Mega Paranzo in the sort of first two <laughs> couple of people you see on screen. It's like, yeah, yeah. there's Mega and, and Phil's like kind of in the poster. And, yeah. and it's, it's kind of really strange because for us, it's kind of, these are people we see all the time. These are people who've been working in chapter and... You know, I saw Mega the other day. She's a really important part of sort of like what's going on in Newport now with kind of all the the art scene and in and, Newport. And she has been for a long time with Miss Mrs. Clark. And it's just it's kind of strange because that sort of time when the experimental music scene, the sort of test step and stuff like that, that would have been like yeah, all the things yeah. that were, were going big, on. So. Big in influence on the film and not just test department but the dark end as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and uh Brick Goff, you know. Um uh, so we we were pulling in because I, I wanted to basically reimagine paganism, mm. um, not as an agricultural faith, but as an industrial faith. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so I was drawing influences from Test Department, from Brickoff, uh, also uh, the uh, Beltane Fire Society mm. in Scotland, so, uh, um, and our chaos, the, uh, the, the, the French circus. So uh, all of that became part of my palette yeah. to to uh, reimagine um, a sort of, sort of a post-industrial paganism, yeah, yeah, um, which um, I think is definitely one of the strengths of the film. Plus the landscape of South Wales and Port mm. Talbot in particular, the steel works. I mean, we, we were shooting all over South Wales from Swansea, Barry to uh, Port Talbot, Cardiff, and Newport. Yeah, Wales isn't used to that really being on screen, sort of celebrated. Yeah, and it's not it's not used to genre. I mean, this mm. this was um, at a time when um, uh, making a horror film was not really you know it was um, it was not really done mm. you know, and especially if you're using government money to make it. Um, what 
what I, I mean, I had Darkness as a strip lying around for several years before I actually got a chance to make it. And it was the advent of the National Lottery right. that, um, that enabled it to happen. Um, and uh, I applied for the, you know, for, for support to, to make it, but the initial application was rejected because I had a, a London-based production company, Metrodome mm -hmm. Films, behind it, and I needed to, to make the production more, more Welsh. So we got Peter Edwards involved, uh, Queenie Air Clue, yeah. and, um, and, and uh, Peter and Clive effectively kind of live produced the film in, in, in Wales. Yeah, so yeah. Th this was made at a time when you know, the very first uh, uh, Arts Council of Wales, you know, kind of National Lottery, the three films were um, uh, House of America, yeah. Dark Lands and Twin Town. Yeah. Those, those, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that was a big moment in Welsh cinema. Is it like being part of that filmmaking community at the time? Well, uh, for me, you know, I wasn't part of the Welsh filmmaking community because at that particular time it was predominantly Welsh language, mm, mm, and I yeah. and I I don't speak Welsh, um, so uh, I felt kind of uh, like I was in no man's land because mm. I couldn't get funding from Wales because I was not a Welsh speaker, and I couldn't get funding from London because I wasn't English. Yeah. So uh, um, it, it, it it was the advent of the national lottery really that sort of changed that. Mm. And allowed for a little bit more in, inclusive, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, of, of because before that it was you know headwind, hang up roses. It was all Welsh language. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so this, the, those three films were the first kind of English language, apart from Carl Francis, of, of course, with the yeah, yeah. social realism and Ken Loach kind of uh, vibe. Um, but um, these these were new new filmmakers coming through, um, yeah. and um, you know, and, and somebody from Newport and. Quite anglicised, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But a, a different voice and a different genre. What point did the arts council come? Was that sort of somewhere in the beginning with the scripts? When mm. you sort of changed it to be in Wales? Or? Uh, no, it, I mean it was always set in Wales, mm. um, and um, the arts council were basically the the, the organisation empowered to spend the lottery money. You know, yeah. So um, that's that's really. So I I, I made an application. I I raised them um, two hundred and fifty thousand from London through mm. uh, producer Paul Brooks. Yeah. He used to be uh, an estate agent losing property and there was a tax incentive then called the DES and he had a long term ambition to produce films so, mm. and he worked out that you could actually use the same tax incentive that he was using for property to uh, invest in film. Yeah, yeah. So um, he agreed to come in with 250000 and the way the lottery worked was matching funding. Yeah, you know, they, it still works very much like that. With yeah. two fifty, they would match the funding. Um, and apart from the initial problem of not being Welsh enough, um, um, because we didn't have a Welsh producer, um, uh, as soon as the other came out with Peter, and and Peter was an amazing champion of mm. uh, people like myself um, and other fil filmmakers that have come through. You know, he would uh, stick his neck out and yeah. and um, and make sure opportunities you know came about. So he 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 was a very important figure, I think in. Welsh cinema at that particular time. The genre film, because I mean, it's like now there's this, I mean, in the last, well, sort of with digital really, there's there's lots of like genre filmmakers in, in, in mm. Wales just sort of taking advantage for the, the ease of digital. Mm. And some of them have sort of gone sort of straight to, you know, kind of straight to streaming or they've just self-released and things like that. But obviously that, you know, working on film, that's a whole different different thing. So, yeah. so yeah. working on genre, were there any sort of supporters of genre filmmaking at that time? In, 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 in Wales. Wales? Well, no, I mean, it, it was at a time when uh, je, uh, the horror genre tends to work in cycles. Mm. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, seven years where the market, you know, had had enough of horror films and were looking, yeah. were looking for something different. So, uh, in a way, that was a good thing because it, 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 you know, Dark, Dark Lens came in, left the field, mm. and, and, um, and actually sort of. Um, uh, uh, Surprised a lot of people. I think it surprised the lottery, and it surprised a lot of people in Wales that, God, you know, how on earth is somebody who's made a horror film? Yeah. And yeah. and you know, I uh, it's been sort of identified as possibly possibly being the first indigenous Welsh horror film. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there have been horror films made in Wales, but not 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 Welsh horror films as mm. such. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's another there's a film screening tonight that was probably shot in in Wales. Um, but it's not a Welsh. Yeah. It's not a Welsh horror film. Yeah. Because this is, and and possibly the first. I mean, yeah. I, I'm open to uh, somebody, you know, informing me that there actually there was this 
film shot in Bangor, you know, in the, in the 60s or whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, I mean, just so, so the audience, so we're, we're doing this this season at the moment um, on sort of like sort of putting the Welsh in context of this sort of horror and see, seeing our story. Like we sort of start, I've sort of started it with um, sort of the old dark house, which obviously mm. isn't, you know, they there is allusions everywhere to the fact that it's 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 Welsh, like and then so the old dark house. If you didn't see it, James Whale obviously coming from Hollywood to Boris, Boris Karloff. And it's like, you know, but there's there's a lot of this where, you know, it's like Wales is the other. Wales is that dark, miserable place where horrible things happen. Mm. And um and yeah, but so very rarely is anything actually was actually made here. I mean, we've got Gwai Dowser, which is again it was Welsh language for sort of Blood and the Stars. Um we're gonna be showing that in November, which was um kind of a comedy horror. It was more of a kind of like I stabbed the fiend horror film kind of you know just made for tv yeah. but yeah in terms of like mm. actually being made something that was made in wales mm. purposefully yeah yeah this might be the first yeah i mean th th this was at a time when like peter jackson i think was yeah. uh, he was coming through in new zealand um but when in fact he'd come through earlier on in new zealand with um with brain dead and, mm. and, and and things like that um and i remember going to Cannes, and the only sort of um uh, film government film body that was supporting genre was New Zealand, and it was right. uh, because of Peter Jackson. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He he made it sort of a, a viable international thing, mm. and um, and you know I think maybe Darklands opened up the doors in Wales for that to become you know um, not a tradition, but at least at least um, you know to, to for different filmmakers and genre filmmakers to come through, and and in the last sort of five or six years, I've noticed more and more that. Uh, you know, um, not just the mainstream, but also the you know the art house um, elevated um, side yeah, of cinema yeah. is embracing genre. Yeah. You know, we had a French genre film win Cannes uh, mm. uh, last year, Titan, and um, and it's 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 just becoming more. You know, it's coming through as more of a sort of there's not this um, rejection of it. There's not this sort of predisposition against it that yeah. that, that, that there used to be. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because we've got, um, I don't know if you've seen uh, The Feast Grev, the um, the Welsh horror of the year, mm. um, of, of this year. So um, it's screening this this weekend. And uh, and again, it's, it's it's really interesting sort of just to juxtapose Dark Crowns with that because that's kind of like, it's sort of talk about mythic folklore yeah. in a different way. Mm. But it's, you know, it's in the Welsh language and, um, you know, sort of taking a different sort of stance on it. But it's, it's, it's really interesting that the folk horror does seem to be a theme that sort of runs... When the streets, where did the idea come from? When you, when you were well, I was. I'm, I'm a big fan of horror films, and and there were many influences on this film. Obviously, The Wicker Man. Yeah. But also The Omen. Yeah. And Rosemary's Baby. I think those were the mm. three films that I was sort of you know drawing influences from. Um, also, maybe Race with the Devil. Oh right. Um, yeah. Which is a great sort of um, relatively unknown mm. um, folk horror. Um, which I'm sure had big inspirations on Mad Max and the and, mm. the, and the car chases mm. there, um, and um, but also um, American political political conspiracy thrillers of the seventies, Marathon Man, yeah. Parallax View, Three Days with Condor, yeah. um, uh, stories where you know there's one person at the centre of a conspiracy, mm. um, and uh, so I, it wasn't just the horror genre that I was drawing on; it was also those films that I love, you know. Yeah. So, um, okay. Um, and you know, I I think that I'm a big one for subtext and metaphor. Mm. You know, that's to be the the danger was I would come up with something that's a carbon copy of what's been done before. But yeah. by by placing it in Wales and giving it that political subtext, you know, a, a, a bit between the you know the the, the, the old and the new and uh, and nationalism mm. and uh, and the politics of Wales and my frustrations of being sort of you know. A, the Welshman who doesn't speak the language who wasn't getting the opportunities because yeah. of that you know yeah. so all of that I, I, I used to sort of give it um, a sense of place and a sense of originality yeah because it's really interesting like you sort of looking back on it like sort of from now like is it just a few years before the evolution mm. sort of came in and it's that that sort of moment when sort of like you know the, the idea of the sort of the um, yeah the graffiti and things like that that you said that did you, you did used to see in the, the old places and, yeah. and and it's um, but yeah, just sort of having a twist on it. It must have been really refreshing to kind of see that kind of like you know at the time, like oh okay, so we're doing that with it and sort of yeah. changing that around. Yeah, no, I just thought it would give it a, you know a sense of, of place, a 
of um, you know this is uh, you know sort of playing about with what's happening in Wales and mm. you know the post-industrialization yeah. whole the whole thing and it's um, uh, just an interesting you know it's not a social realistic film about but yeah. it's within the genre you you can play about with those things and, and make it feel a little bit more possible a little bit more real. How would you approach like sort of making a horror film now in Wales? Do you think? Um, well, in general, you know, um, I think it, it, it would um, have to be quite different. You know, I, I think that at the end of the day, uh, Darklands at times was a bit of a pantomime. Mm. You know, there, there, there was, um, uh, you know, it's a bit of a melodrama. It's a bit, it's a bit sort of um, a bit dark at times, you know. And, uh, and I, w I would, my, my approach to it now would be much more refined mm. um, and sophisticated sort of way, you know, and, 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 and play it more, more real, less of a panto. Yeah. But it's really <laughs> um, charming but, for that, though. But yeah. you're right, you know, I, I think I might, you know, I might take the fun out of it if I just do it that way. Yeah. You know, cause they, they, it, yeah. it surprises me sometimes where I meet people and they're just like, oh, Dark Rams is your best film. I'm going, best film since <laughs> 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 um, And, um, you know, it annoys me actually that, that um, but I think it's because of, of the, the cinematography, the mm. landscape, the, mm. the the pagan costumes, and yeah. all of those things create a, 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 something that is cinematic, yeah. visual, yeah. not not just you know a, a TV uh, you know um, procedural thriller. Mm. The danger is if you take all that out, then you're left with something that you see on TV every day with mm. cops and hospitals and yeah. you know, and, yeah. and and too much realism. Yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, you sort of you know you start the film with you know sort of Marega uh, throwing chokes and and, <laughs> <laughs> and like you know Phil Babbitt with a chainsaw, you know like yeah, you know yeah. heavy makeup on. It's um yeah, it's it's kind of it's again that it kind of feels um so so idiosyncratic. So like of its you know well the Ed was loose. Itself. I mean the Ed was loose on that film. I was yeah. young, you know. I I, I wasn't. To make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably more afraid now. <laughs> <laughs> but you went into an edit on it though. I mean, and, and it actually is, it is because it's a different version that what I'd seen before as well. Obviously, we've all just seen this version for the first time. Um, so yeah, I mean, how how difficult was that to go to go back and like? Oh, yeah. Thank God for that. You know, it, it's like you 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 live with the stuff that you that you you hate. You know, mm. it's like oh god, yeah. It's it's often dialogue. It's fun at a. You know, because this was about conceiving a child, you know, mm. and so we the, we, we had um, two two set scenes in the film that the actress was very uncomfortable about shooting actually, mm. um, and you know we we persuaded her to shoot them and and act them. You know, I, I never felt comfortable with them. I just thought you know we, we don't need to see that. It's awkward. It's it's uncomfortable. It's uh, it's clumsy, you know. So um so I cut I, I cut them both out. Mm. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to 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 shoot a sex and get it right. I mean, don't look now is probably the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you really, you know, it, it 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 can be very awkward and you know, and just doesn't work. So I'm glad to see them gone. But then it's like actually, you know, like especially you know towards the end of sort of the sort of Becky character, you know, that that kind of feels like it needs to be over the top things, mm. you know, like mm. you know. Ridiculous. Yeah, and that kind of felt like yeah. that's you know that's the Rosemary's Baby coming through, isn't it? It's yeah, like, yeah, that definitely is, and that's that's the it. Yeah, running riot. Yeah, know, yeah. Through, through the film because it was an opportunity to create a montage. Yeah, you know, and to um, the music's a big part of the film. The music's amazing, um, I was going to say. And, yeah, um, especially the end credits. I love that track. Yeah, Heather Jones. Uh, yeah, it, 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 I was like, oh, oh, that's yeah. gotta be that's gotta be Heather Jones, and then sort of singing yeah. it at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, 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 I remember when we shot that scene with Nicola, um, we actually had the music already composed. Oh, really? So it was like a dance. It was like the Sergio yeah. Sioni kind of approach where you play the music as you're shooting mm. and and, um, and you know, all the movements, everything was done to the music. Right. Um, and, that, and that created the right, because again, it would have been really awkward and uncomfortable to shoot that scene. Yeah. But, but when you do it to music and you turn it into a dance and a performance, it doesn't. Mm. It becomes, mm. a, a, you know, it transcends itself, it yeah. becomes something else. So how did all that happen then with, with the music? Obviously you said you talked about Tess Department and, and Biff Goff and, and you know all that, all that kind of, all those influences. Yeah. But well um, uh, again when Paul Brooks came on board as producer he'd just done a film where you know he had a couple of guys in Liverpool that he worked with on all of his films uh, doing the music mm. 
um, uh, Sean Murphy and, uh, and and David Hume, yeah. who went on to do the music for Twenty Eight Days Later. Yeah, yeah. You know? And um, so uh, uh, John and, and David came in, and I I gave them my influences such as you know Chet Spartan and uh, uh, Chris Roth, uh, and um, and they just went with it, you know. And uh, it's 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 very weird the um, the uh, the Heather Jones track at the end because I was up in Liverpool um, doing the film with them, and I said, you know, I wish we had some lyrics at the end, and and they said, well, why don't you write them? You know, read the song before, you know? <laughs> so I so so I sat down and wrote wrote out sort of a curse, mm. um, and I thought, well, you know, it's going to be in Welsh. So I phoned up an actor friend of mine, Nick McLaughlin, you know, and right. can you translate this to Welsh? And, and he did, and then okay, who do we get to sing it? I can't sing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, John and David found Heather mm. and just brought her in. Yeah. And when I listened to her singing, I was like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I write that. <laughs> it's amazing because it sounds it so was, fresh. It sounds like yeah. something that could be on, you know, kind of could be played now. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's very much kind of like it's yeah, it's it's so kind of eerie and wonderful. You know, mm. and that kind of it feels quite electronic y in, in yeah. some way. You know, it's just really yeah. Well, we we're sort of so, going for that clan ad kind of you mm. know vibe, um, and uh, I'm I'm planning to do a four K ultra HD release of the film um, on, on Blu-ray. Next year, um, so it'll be you know sort of Blu-ray, DVD. So I'll have a CD as well mm. of the soundtrack, yeah. and I'm going to do a little documentary about the making of the film. So it'll be the Fantastic. whole package. Yeah, you know, try and yeah. put the film into some context. Yeah, I think it's important yeah. to do that. Yeah, because that's the thing. It's just like I mean, this like I say the, the point of the season is is sort of showing people that it's like you know because obviously they've got full and that's done really well this this year, but it's kind of you know the history of. Welsh horror is like it's far more, you know, kind of interesting, and, and yeah, there's all these stories that that risk getting lost because this film, um, you know, it's one of those films that uh, did kind of like, you know, was you just couldn't get hold of, and so you know, like Colin will see late, later as well, you know, it was just like somewhere, it's somewhere maybe, you know, well, you know so. what this is a frustrating part of, of being a filmmaker is mm. often you know it's one thing making the film, and then it's another film uh, thing getting it. Um, you know, sold correctly and distributed correctly. Yeah, yeah. So the the problem we had with this was, um, yeah, when you make a film, it's all about what happens to the film in North America. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, in 1996, we um, uh, they were choosing ten films for Toronto Midnight Madness. Mm. Dark Times was the eleventh. Yeah, yeah. It just didn't make it by one. Mm. And Colin came up to me in town and just said, "I loved your film." I'm, Really sorry we couldn't play it because it yeah. just got squeezed out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know it just fell short of doing what the Ray did, you know, yeah. and 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 making a big impact at Toronto Midnight Madness and then getting a big North American deal. So then I I went to a, a festival in Korea in um, uh, Busan. Mm. It's the very first fantastic film festival yeah. in just outside Seoul, and Roger Corman was on the jury. Oh wow. So Roger watched the film, and I know that Roger released <coughs> Liquor Man yeah. in the US. So I went up to him after the screening, and I said, "What do you think?" You know, it was the, he said, "I, I want to, I want to release it in, oh, in North fantastic. America." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I phoned Paul Brooks, and I put them in touch with each other, and they couldn't work out <coughs> because Paul wanted more money than Roger was willing yeah. to pay. You know, and there's me to be involved with Roger. Yeah, Coleman. you just you've got Roger Corman. It's my dream come true. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but it never happened. And the film actually um, never got distribution in North America. Mm. Um, Metrodome um, uh, got sold uh, as a production company and became a distribution company. Yeah. Um, the film was released on VHS, but um, but it, you know it, it was never really released on DVD. And I spent probably fifteen years trying to work out who had the rights. Yeah. Um, eventually, I, I I found who had the rights and, and managed. You know, it was Metrodome. But it was the new people who didn't realise that they they had it. Yeah. And um, I just said, look, I'm I'm now a sales agent as well as a filmmaker. I'd like to take on the film for world sales because the sales agency that was selling the film that also sold Dog Soldiers, uh, Victor Films, um, they went bust. Mm. So nobody was actually actively yeah selling the film. So I managed to get the rights. And I think it was 2012, and um, I managed to get a DVD release in the US, but it was it's already too late. You know, yeah. it, it was uh, yeah. the ship had already sort of left the port yeah. by, by by then, but I'm I'm staying with it 
and you know because I believe it's going to be worth it. And um, I was talking to Shudder last week, and they're going to pick it up for North America. This week, yeah. and, they'll, and they'll swap the version swap it that out. they've got. Yeah. You know, currently playing in the UK. So, so it's good to get it on Shudder yeah. because Shudder yeah. is curated, and then it's it's um, you know it sh it shows the the more elevated side of the film. Yeah, yeah, and also it's like I mean horror fans, you know, uh, we are the best. Sorry, we are. Um, horror fans are, are, are really loyal, and and they we do kind of like we've got little gems that we keep, and mm. we sort of like tell everybody about them, and we share yeah. things. And it, there is there is something about sort of horror fandom that kind of kind of can you know get these things a bit of traction, which is which is lovely. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't really get that as much with uh, you know like a serious period drama. You don't get kind of you know people posting memes of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of people, you know people with chainsaws and bits and bobs <laughs> but um yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's it's it's, it's good to be a horror fan right i'm just going to see if there's any more anybody anybody's got a question a burning question obviously we have some of the family in the audience so i'm gonna actually if that's all right i'm gonna ask a question of you what was it like seeing it in cinema again that's the first time i've seen it yeah yeah so it was uh i thought it was great uh, especially all of the the, uh, the atmosphere of Port Talbot and yeah. you know, the industrial side of it, and the music was excellent. And it, I thought they married really well. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I was like really pleasantly surprised. I really was. I thought the acting was superb, absolutely mm. superb till the end of it. The only thing I didn't like was the sex scene. So. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like seeing yourself after 25 years? It's very brief. <laughs> yeah. See if Wait. you stood out in the cold all night. <laughs> yeah, where were you? Which, which service which um, service station was it? Barry somewhere, was it? Barry. Uh, yeah, it I think... Uh, I, no, I, I th Bridge End, maybe. Bridge End. Yeah. I, when I make films now, I'm shooting them in 15 days, mm. you know, um, on a fraction of the budget. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is the way filmmaking has evolved. It's Frustrating, actually, um, but um, so we had a, we had luxury with this yeah, way, uh, yeah. because we had more money and, and more time. But it was overwhelming. Um, you know, I wasn't in control of certain elements as uh, as I would be now. Mm. You know, um, I think you know, sort of um, choice of locations, sometimes the interiors, costumes, you know, makeup. Uh, um, I, I I I I should have been more sort of on on to that you know mm. um, because you kind of expect you kind of expect that you know, when you shoot in Wales sometimes uh, you know you'll come across like hospitals you want blue curtains and and you don't want flowery ones mm. it can be a bit chintzy yeah. you know and uh, you really have to uh, 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 completely take everything out of the location and redress it to yeah, keep it in yeah. a tone of the genre yeah um, mm. So we were fighting that all the way through. We actually didn't have the the budget to to rip everything out and put it back in. Mm. Uh, and uh, so when I saw the location, I imagined it was going to be dressed mm. um, or redressed. And then when I turned up on the day, it wasn't. It was like, oh, too late. Yeah. You know? um, so the, the, there's um, I'm I'm much more onto uh, production design um, and and makeup. And, uh, and costume now, mm -hmm. much more in, in control of it when I direct because uh, because of Darth Vader. Yeah, because yeah. when I watch it, I just think, oh god, that those pink lights in that house, you know, it shouldn't be pink. That's the wrong, the wrong color for the the tone of the genre. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, and and it, it's sort of stuff like that. Yeah, you know? and, yeah. and that's you you learn yeah. while making mistakes. Did it did it do well enough to actually put it on the map? Like? Because I, I felt as if it did. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it got reasonable distribution in, in the UK. Mm. Um, you know, it was, um, it was Fox, Pathé, uh, but released it in the UK. But what, what really makes the difference um, between a film doing well and not is whether it goes theatrical. Okay. Um, and the, the theatrical release for this was very limited. Mm. Um, a couple of prints. Yeah. You know, so it was essentially... Um, uh, uh, it was Rupert Preston, actually, at, at Vertigo, who had a okay. company there yeah. who, who did the theatrical release, and he booked it into Cinema Fumé, mm -hmm. you know, like a, 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 a cinema in London where everyone would go and smoke and, and watch film. 
um, and um, you know, the odd independent cinema yeah. around the country, maybe yeah. five, five or six. Yeah. But you know, it's it, you really you really need um, you know a, a print in all in all the all the rags, all the yeah. all, all the magazines. Yeah, that's what I remember. Effects, yeah. Fangoria, and it was it was in the mall. Um, but but that's for the horror niche, mm. you know. And to to get mainstream recognition, you really have to be on, you know, a uh, hundred screens in the in the UK and a thousand screens in the US. Mm. And, and most films, especially genre films, don't do that. They mm. they go they, mm. they go straight to home video. I mean this. I mean it, just to, just to say for now we've we've got um slightly we obviously things things change over the years and uh we've, we're the so chapters the BFI Film Hub and so we've got the audience network. And so um, there's a bit more of a kind of with Made in Wales, um, mm -hmm. anything that's even tenuously sometimes, you know, yeah. sort of Welsh, like shot here, Welsh talents involved somehow, that kind of thing. But obviously a film that's shot here about Wales and mm -hmm. using Welsh talent, um, we heavily support that. And we yeah. sort of also encourage um, getting that into cinemas around, I mean, as we yeah. have with Glebe as well, which it ended up being sort of Picture House, which has got mm -hmm. sort of like screens around the country, around the UK. But it's... Um, yeah, I mean that's the thing. Support Welsh film. I mean that's yeah. that's the, the biggest thing, you know. Yeah, I mean that it's important to do that um, mm. uh, because uh, you, you know you're you're um, then then you're appealing to the you know a much wider audience yeah. um, in, in a different kind of way. I remember going into HMV um, in Newport and seeing a Welsh cinema section. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and then wondering why summer scars. Uh, I was going to say, I really it. like Summer Scars. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. really yeah. do, actually. And, and it's like, I, I phoned up the distributor and I said, why, why, why isn't Summer Scars in the Welsh cinema section in HMV in, in Wales? And they said, oh, we didn't even know there was a set. Ray had just done a film with Louis Mao. Yes, yeah, yeah. damage. And, um, and, you know, he, he was wonderful to work with, actually. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, um, actually there's a documentary called mm. Grab. Yeah. Um, which has yeah. been done about him and it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Mark, yeah. Mark, Mark Evans. They, yeah, they won an award at yeah. the Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's like how 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 do, how to make something with nothing. You yeah. Know, that that film. Um, but you know, Ray's story is fantastic. Yeah. You know, it's it's, yeah. uh, it's almost like a, uh, you know, a sort of a rosebud kind yeah. of um, you know, approach. Um, uh, guy in hospital piecing together his his life. Mm. Uh, it's great. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's just it's such such a lovely sort of like reminder that like you know people like like Ray was kind of you know we're just working on these sets and it's like and it just like mucking in and, yeah. and it's just it was, yeah it was, it was yeah it was some um, Clive Waldron um who the line producer who brought in Ray and mm. thought that thought um, Ray would be a good idea and I just thought yeah I mean because I yeah. I used to have an uncle that was a Welsh um, international rugby player ah. uh, Rex Richards you know so uh, um, as soon as I you know, thought oh, get 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 a Welsh international in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and Clive also brought uh, Kim Kim Ryan in as yep. well, who was Ray's sidekick. You know, mm. and uh, both both of them were great. Yeah. yeah. And you know, with John Finch, we needed an actor to come in, somebody who was who was well known. Mm. You know, that that was definitely going to be our, you know, what we were going to sell the film on. I wanted Anthony Hopkins, of course. Of oh, course. Cool. Um, and and I sort of. Uh, knew Anthony Hopkins from meeting him at a an event in in London, um, and uh, you know uh, he actually kind of phoned up uh, my house in in Newport because we lived thirteen doors from his mother. Ah. You know, and um, you know after meeting him in, in that event, he he phoned up my parents' house when I was out. You know, <laughs> um, and uh, when I came home, my mother said, "Oh." Anthony Perkins just called. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I said, Anthony Perkins, he's dead. You know, and then Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. Um, so when I wrote Darklands, I, I took the script up to his mm. mum's house and just said, Oh, he, he said, yeah. you know, um, you know, he would look at anything that, that, that I wrote, you know, and uh, but he was shooting Shadowlands at the time. Oh, of course, you know, yeah. And, and and wasn't available. Yeah. Um, so it didn't work out. But uh, but it was Paul Brooks that came up with John Finch. Mm. And John Finch had been in a student film at the National Film School. I went to the National, um, and it was a, 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 a student film that John Finch had been in and, and um, had seen him in that. So mm. it was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, what, and when I spoke to John about, you know, the character, you know, he, he 
he described David Keller as a bit of a windbag, you know, <laughs> you know spout, spouting on about this and that politically. Um, and uh, he, he, you know, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to model this on, on Neil Kinnock. Right. And I said, mm, um, my, Michael Hesselkind yeah. would be still. I mean, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, Paul Brooks and I, we, you know, we wanted to make him more patrician, I think was the word. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why we sort of went for somebody not, not, not too obviously Welsh you know, <laughs> and, 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 and went for, a, for the Hesseltine kind of vibe. Yeah. Right, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Round of applause, thank you. Thank you.